terminologies and patterns and pathology right from beginning and we're repeating it. So sit back and let's uh, start with this. Well, there are certain disclaimers even from my side. It's for teaching and compiled as usual from experience, textbooks and journals and authors who we have acknowledged and there's no financial interest to de or conflict of interest to declare and none of us get paid for the, these talks. Uh, well, all of you know what this is. That's pathology for you in Greek and Latin. Now, let's see a medical student when wants to take a post graduation would be either crazy or sane. Then if he's crazy, it depends on his attention span. If it is significant, then of course he takes up psychiatry. If it is non-existent, he has to take up emergency medicine. Well, if he's sane, it depends whether he's hard working or yeah, so it depends whether he's hard working and if he's not so much hard working, then it depends whether he's afraid of the light or the dark. If he's afraid of light, then he takes up radiology. If he's afraid of darkness and he thinks big, he takes dermatology. If he thinks small, he takes up ophthalmology. If he's very hard working, depends on his attitude. If it is nice or mean, or doesn't matter. If he's mean, he takes up surgery. Nice, if he hates adults, he takes pediatrics, he or she, and hates children, then it's medicine. If it doesn't matter, if the patient is asleep, takes up anesthesia, is dead, apparently he takes up pathology. But this was given to me this is by a psychiatrist. And, but let me tell you, nowadays, when I ask some of my students, why did you take up pathology? Uh, well, the system now is such that it's very difficult. And uh, often, you, they tell me that this is what I got. But anyway, if you have taken pathology, you can sit and enjoy. It's one of the best subjects that you have got, you can enjoy. And it's something you will learn about so many diseases, from lichen planus to glioblastoma multiforme. There's hardly any branch that deals with all the known diseases that human beings. Well, this is pathology for you. It comes from pathos and logia. And the problem is, many of these terminologies will be new to you when you join this. Uh, uh, when you join pathology. We are here to decipher some of them. For example, you just see it's X and L, it's Latin, they're consonants. If the Roman, it's 40. And well, if you go to a garment shop, it's the size of the garment. So things mean different in different contexts. You know? So some of the terms that we use. So once you keep learning the subject, you'll automatically learn the words. It's not very difficult. The general way that we diagnose, in there are two or three ways that all of us use for diagnosis. One, for example, a clinician finds a person with fever and dysuria. He thinks it must be an urinary tract infection. And the commonest is a gram-negative bacteria. He gives an appropriate antibiotic. And if he is cured, of course, it explains the clinical situation as well as the diagnosis. Even sometimes uh, the patient becomes better by the time the culture and sensitivity report comes. So this is what is called a payoff. We often make a diagnosis. Sometimes people call this a gut feeling and so on and so forth. But it's generally not gut feeling. It's the result of a lot of experience. Right. Now, the other way is, suppose there's a granuloma which 
and if the AFB negative, you know, it's tuberculosis in our country. That's the most common diagnosis. Put him on ATT, whether the AFB is positive or not, whether the culture is positive or not. And if he does well, well, your diagnosis stands and you're vindicated. So these are the payoff systems that you do. And of course, if you have a culture and all, is and that's the best thing. The other way is especially during learning. You're finding, is this a granuloma? Yes, it does look like a granuloma. It's almost like a yes, no. Is this granuloma caseating or not? Confluent or not? Ah, yes. This granuloma is not caseating, but I searched elsewhere and there's a granuloma that is caseating. That's great. So is there an AFB? Let's do an AFB stain. Might be tuberculosis. You have a list of differential diagnoses. You do an AFB stain. AFB is positive. Ah, yes, since AFB is positive, this must be tuberculosis. So this is the way that we go on. And this is the heuristic analysis, a goal-seeking process. This yes-no is very good while learning in your initial stages. And after some time, it happens at the back of your mind. You don't have to ask these questions. And then, by that time, by seeing many slides, certain patterns are imprinted in your mind. Initially, while you compare these, uh, the pattern in the slide with that in a WHO fascicle or some other textbook, after some time, all those pictures are in your mind and your brain matches them as so fast that after some time it becomes spinal level for some uh, diseases. But invariably there will be tough ones and you will have to use the heuristic analysis. But what is essential is you must do a clinical pathological correlation. And it's better to see slides on your own, make an impression and then try to go back and see if you can explain the clinical uh, yes, the features. And you look at the form and if it matches, it's a wonderful feeling and you know that it, you know, your diagnosis is within a two or three differential, possible differential diagnosis. And this is the way if you do, you learn a lot. That's the most important. So let's see the words that we use. First, I think, let's see this, can I put it down, okay, the word active, you see the slides that we see includes fixed cells that are neatly um, framed actually and it's a snapshot at one time in whatever the lesion is undergoing and this is at high speed. So let's see, this is almost like you're seeing the water droplet just falling uh, into the pond. So dynamic terms such as activity are supposed to be logically incorrect, although these are implied whenever you use them. In non-neoplastic lesions, you have piecemeal necrosis in the liver, which is used as active hepatitis proliferation and neutrophils in glomerulus, which is called active glomerulonephritis. Neutrophils in colonic crypts and crypt abscesses is called active colitis. So you use terms like active in such non-neoplastic condition. Neoplastic lesions, sometimes they are referred to as uh, tumors that are proliferating with a lot of mitosis and in fact, uh, Mitotic activity is often used synonymously with the so-called mitotic index. But it's better to indicate the number of mitosis per unit area. And you know that is done in breast and other cancers. So there is a case for restricting its use and replacing by more uh, very descriptive terms. So this is an active hepatitis, piecemeal necrosis there active colitis and an active neoplastic lesion with mitosis here and there, one, two, three, easily which can be seen, okay? So, 
Next, we come to another thing with the adenoid system. It's seen in several tumors, especially salivary gland tumors. It almost looks like cribriform. But one has to know that uh, adenoid cystic carcinomas have two types of cells, the myoepithelial cells and the smaller epithelial cells. And the cribriform carcinoma is made up of monomorphic epithelial cells without myoepithelial cells. So this would be the two different examples of a cribriform carcinoma and an adenoid cystic. Now we'll see if my, these adenoid cystic spaces are actually myoepithelial line spaces which are not glandular spaces but invaginations of the stroma that gives the appearance as if it's the inside of a gland. Now look at this area. You see the stroma is going inside here and this is actually a double layered, almost like a tubule that has been compressed by the stroma. So if you look at the edge of an adenoid cystic carcinoma, you will find the stroma entering into these areas and these are cut sections of the similar areas and they look almost as if this is a gland with a secretion and a cribriform appearance. But closely, if you see, they are bilayered. It's almost like a tubule that's been compressed. Okay, here also you see this. Is This is how you make out an adenoid cystic. This is another area. So nicely the stroma is inside and you find this almost like a tubule, two layers of cells. Of course, you have immunohistochemistry and other things. This is cribriform, purely epithelial cells with a real lumen in between, almost punched out holes that you're finding here. That's a lumen here, and this is a cribriform. So next to come to anaplasia, another thing we did. Anaplasia means reverting to a more primitive or less differentiated form. Ana means reversion and placine is to form. Undifferentiated means lack of differentiation. It hasn't gone back. It is there. At that stage, it is lacks any differentiation or similarity to the differentiated cells. So if this person goes back, that would be an anaplasia. And if it's undifferentiated right throughout, he would be undifferentiated, right? So, if a final year MD student goes back to a form that's similar to your first MBBS student, he has undergone an anaplasia. But if he is like this throughout, then he, is, he hasn't differentiated, so he or she is undifferentiated. Well, this is how it is. So, see these, but they almost look alike, you know, uh, this anaplastic and uh, undifferentiated tumor. But for the sake of <coughs> understanding, you must know that the terms, although they are used interchangeably, anaplasia is best restricted to nuclear changes. Tumor which is hyperchromatic, close uh, with the coarse clumped chromatin and irregular nuclear nucleoli is best called anaplasty, whereas differentiation you use for cytoplasmic features. So a small cell carcinoma of the lung would qualify for a, an anaplastic carcinoma, but not an undifferentiated tumor. On the other hand, if you see, uh, you see Wilms tumor, the anaplastic Wilms is based purely on nuclear features. So you have this multipolar polypoid mitotic figures, nuclear enlargement and hyperchromasia. So anaplasia best kept for nuclear and differentiation for cytoplasmic features. Well, see this, what would you call it? This, because of the nuclear features, although there's some cytoplasm, this would be anaplastic, right? And in the case of thyroid, you have a poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma and one that's called undifferentiated and anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. In the poorly differentiated form, 
you have here is the amino chemistry that helps although they may look somewhat alike there's new diffuse nuclear positivity for ttf1 and dot like for thyroglobulin whereas for the undifferentiated ttf1 is negative and the thyroglobulin is also negative so this include this indicates this undifferentiated anaplastic type is more primitive next with a we come to as a party effect or phenomenon to describe by john as a party is a very famous breast pathologist also described it in lung tumors where you get a smudgy blue appearance especially in the necrotic areas and they are in the wall of blood vessels and these are characteristically described in lung carcinomas you can see it in other condition this is nothing but smudged dna similar to this but uh, not the same is the hematoxyphil body or hematoxylin bodies as the right term this is seen in lupus and this is smudgy dna in the nucleus you can see them uh, in the uh, renal uh, epithelial cell sometimes in case of lupus nephritis but they are very rare in fact one of my teachers who was a stalwart in renal pathology uh, she said that if you if anybody has seen an hematoxylin body of gross he has seen god himself so it was that rare apparently at that time but you do see them sometimes you see them in the spleen also then amianthoid bodies these amianthoid bodies you know they are pink brightly pink uh, the central part is more dark the uh, eosinophilic the periphery is light they are composed of two types of collagen type 3 and type 1 invariably find you may find a blood vessel in the middle and uh, this is seen in uh, internodal my um, palisaded myofibroblastoma that's the classic one but people have described in smooth muscle tumors of the uterus in uh, neural mmas uh, schwannomas and so on and so forth but classically seen in internodal palisaded myofibroblastoma it comes from the word similar to amianthus and that's a greek word for undefiled and it's a used for a type of parachrysotile which is uh, used for asbestos and the uh, so they are of blue green yellow and red color and some of them have this beautiful pink color the amaranthus fruit that you see has this color it's a rosy pink color and uh, perhaps it's because of this and the fibers are very fine some of the asbestos fibers are very fine and coming to asbestos i think uh, there's something else you should know in asbestos you get ferruginous bodies and nothing but asbestos fibers encrusted with uh, hemosiderin and ferritin and then in fact it's said that it's most probably these are uh, iron encrusted bodies which are engulfed by uh, you know macrophages and they have iron you can do a pearl stain so this is a ferruginous body this is with f but i think in tammy and third body now b b is for balloon cell balloon cells are nothing but large distended cells invariably they are somewhat clear you know balloon cells are usually clear in many of the non neoplastic condition like in the liver uh, this balloon cells are nothing but hydropic change the sodium pump doesn't work the water gushes in and so the water this <coughs> salts and water is retained so they become large right but you can get balloon cell nevus clear cell carcinoma sarcomas where the cells are ballooned and so on so blastomas blastoma means it comes from the word blastus or sprout a germ and they indicate very very undifferentiated cells which are very primitive formed like germ cells and so on and so forth you have various blastomas right 
Then you have columnar and cuboidal. Columnar cells, the height is more than the breadth. And in cuboidal, like a cube, almost all the four, all the six sides are of similar size. Okay, so columnar is like a common, uh, this column and cuboidal is like a cube. So you have columnar epithelium, this is in the endocervix and this is the cuboidal epithelium, right? So you have this cribriform, cribriform, uh, you have these little spaces among sheets of cells and it comes from the word cribrum or sieve. So you have almost uniform spaces here and it's uh, and these are generally found in carcinomas of the breast, prostate, colon, endometrium and other sites. You must distinguish this from adenoid cystic carcinoma and call external bodies and sometimes glands which are arranged almost back to back with hardly any epithelium nearby in between. Okay, so that's how it is. Okay. Some people are asking that I should use the laser pointer. Okay. Can you see this? I'm sorry. Right? So this is the sieve, and that's what you can see. Okay. So oh it won't go till I push it off. That's the problem. Next, we come to call exner bodies described by Louis Call and Sigmund Exner. Right? You see, you here also you see spaces with a neosinophilic material and nuclei almost arranged perpendicular. And sometimes you do find grooves in these nuclei. Right? So this is the typical call exner body and find them in certain tumors, which of course you learn when you do gynec path uh, well. Now then you have Swiss cheese pattern. Swiss cheese patterns, all those who have read Tom and Jerry com comics will know that this is nothing but this characteristic of certain cheese found in Switzerland where you have uh, these holes because of the gas bubbles there or during the processing of cheese and you find various holes um, in between of varying sizes and the typical one is seen in the endometrium where you have cis cheese endometrium and these are lined by epithelial cells right so this is cis cheese for you if they are almost uniform and more distributed you call it honeycomb and common is the honeycomb lung. So this is the honeycomb and you find this honeycomb lung which is seen in uh, numerous different end stage lung disease and you find this typical wider spaces almost uniform distributed. Cobblestone appearance. Cob means rounded by water, stones which are rounded by water. These stones were used to pave a path, right? And so you have a cobblestone path. What you see are these stones and in between you are seeing a depressed area that's the ground there. So this is what is seen typically in Crohn's disease. You know, these raised inflamed areas with depressed areas which is the unaffected places. And this gives rise to what is called a cobblestone appearance, right? So you can see them even on endoscopy. Cluster, nest and nidus are almost similar. Uh, it indicates a small group of cells like a bunch of keys or a nest, like a small nest, bird's nest. So you can call a cluster of cells, right? Uh, or you can nidus which is seen in um, osteoid osteoma, osteoblastoma, right? And this is used, this term is used even by radiologists, right? So see this in osteoid osteoma and osteoblastoma. Then you come to crypt. Crypt are very deep uh, structures, you know? And uh, uh, this is in the church also, you'll find uh, 
deeper portions, right, will much below basement level two or three, in fact, uh, which are called the crypts in church, and that's where they used to bury the dead, you know, and it's called, and you must have seen horror movies called Tales of the Crypt and so on, the ghosts would come out from there. So these are very deep openings. You have an opening, mouth, and then a very deep opening. On the other hand, if they are shallow, you call it a pit. Like in the stomach, it's called a gastric pit. So pit is a small, shallow opening. It's a small hole-like thing that you make on the ground, where a crypt is something which is deep, as you see in the colon, normal colon. Then, bosselated. You use the term bosselated when for something on the surface, it's not on cut section. So on the surface, when you have large protrusions, they should be large. Is there a size cut up? No, there isn't a size cut up. But visually, it should be large. That's why you have. It comes from the French word bosse or boss, which is uh, boss means a real boss. You know, so it's a large. Uh, fairly large raised areas that gives an uneven surface texture, almost like an embossed text, you know, which uh, projects from the surface and is very prominent. Okay, so that is how you use the word bosselated for gross and on the surface. On the other hand, you use the term nodule. Nodule, the word nodule comes from a knot. So you use a nodule or nodular appearance when there are small rounded areas which are look more or less separated from each other. They are individual. Usually they are separated by the intervening tissue or connective tissue. And in the kidney, nodular lesions are seen uh, typically in diabetes, glomerulosclerosis, and it refers to this material in the mesangium, it's not in between the cells or in the capillaries, then you don't call, use the term nodular in the kidney. Okay, so this is a nodular lymphoma, and this is, uh, these are nodules in an adenomatous goiter of the thyroid. So nodules are, can be seen in the cut section also. Okay, lobulated, lobulated is somewhat like what you see in a clover leaf, you know. There's a central area with these leaf-like, and if you see, the surface is always smooth. And so you can use lobulated, especially uh, not only in microscopy, but uh, in the gross also. In whenever you, you see a gross tumor in which this could be termed as a lobulated surface. This is smaller than a bosselated, okay? So, the, if you ask, is there a cut of this on quite a high part of the lung, where these are smaller? And these look, seem as if it's connected in one place and with these clover leaf-like things. Unlike nodular, which looks completely separate. For example, a metastatic lesion, you'll call, it has multiple nodules, rounded lesions elsewhere, right? This is a lobulated lesion in the kidney called lobular accentuation in, um, in a case of membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. Here you're not going to use nodular. And please note, it looks like the glomerulus attached here with these lobules being accentuated, okay? So that's how you use use the term, different terms, lobulate, nodular. Now, here, granulomas can be, are actually nodular, you know, and granulomas could be discrete, which means separated from each other, or it could be confluent, when here it looks like two granulomas attached to each other. So, you use confluent nodules when they seem to attached to each other, comes from the word confluence or flowing together. A separate, then you call it discrete. Dysplasia. 
dysplasia is generally used to denote a precancerous or potentially cancerous uh, change but it was also used for certain developmental abnormality but by and large for example fibrocystic disease was called once called mammary dysplasia it's obsolete and it's more commonly a precancerous change with nuclear changes and so on so forth very commonly used in the cervix for example okay and atypia atypical hyperplasia carcinoma in c2 intraepithelial neoplasia are more or less used synonymously although currently intraepithelial neoplasia lesions are these are the are more in vogue than the other ones okay but dysplasia is still used in the colon cervix in melanocyte dysplastic nevus and in the bone marrow whereas atypical hyperplasia is used in the urogenital tract endometrium and urothelium atypi is used in vulva and respiratory tract carcinoma c2 in especially in the breast and intraepithelial neoplasia in various areas including in the endometrium and so on so for cervix so by and large they are all they mean almost the same thing so this was what was called mammary dysplasia earlier you also have renal dysplasia you have a fibrous dysplasia of the bone which are not at all neoplastic in that sense okay? they are not uh, precancerous of course fibrous dysplasia long standing are known to cause uh, result in osteosarcoma but you wouldn't worry on uh, unlike a dysplasia of the cervix or something like that. okay so these are the dysplastic lesion this fibrous dysplasia these are in the breast you see okay then the, the term dystrophy dystrophy is originally used for faulty nutrition this and trophic trophic is nutrient now they are used in different connotation they mean different things in different areas for example vulvar dystrophy it has inflammatory changes and nothing to do with a condition that is known as muscular dystrophy in muscular dystrophy the muscle cells are small as if they have they lack nutrition and of course we know this could be a duchenne's or becker's or spinomuscular atrophy so on and so forth where the fibers are atrophy and there the term dystrophy is used in a different context most of them are uh, they are <coughs> congenital they have a genetic basis unlike vulvar dystrophy right? so epithelium epithelium means upon the nipple actually ruish was studying the circumvallate papillae in the tongue and you see these papillae look almost like a nipple and it found squamous cells which are on top of the lining those uh, nipple like projections in the tongue and he called it uh, that is epithelium those cells are epithelium epi above helium nipple then henley later on adopted henley the loop of henley same gentleman he adopted this for all types of lining cells and that's how it is so this is the epithelium in circumvallate pap fibrinoid necrosis fibrinoid necrosis is not a necrosis i put it here because ef so put it here because uh, this will like tell you it's actually fibrin deposition and it's seen in a variety of autoimmune conditions so fibrin deposition is often called fibrinoid necrosis in certain conditions okay then fibrosis fibrosis you have fibrosis fibrosis in fibrosis we use the word desmoplasia desmus means to restrain and plasis means forming it restrains the cells 
from going anywhere. So that is the desmoplastic tumor. For example, this kind of fibrosis in between the small tumor cells, it's typical of DSR CT or desmoplastic small round cell tumor and intra-abdominal, predominantly intra-abdominal tumor, you can see it anyway. Similarly, there may be tumors with a lot of fibrosis called desmoplastic, a desmoplastic exam, myeloma is one example. Tumor that's almost composed of fibrous tissue. Uh, that's a desmoid tumor for you, okay? So these are the examples where you can use the word desmoplasia. The other words that you use, in a similar context, sclerosis. Use the word sclerosis when grossly it is hard. And often, this has been uh, used even microscopically, but it is it was originally from a gross term which meant hard. For example, a sclerosing tumor actually meant a hard tumor. And similarly, a hard or uh, swelling or tumor was also called sclerus, and it comes from a the word callus or a heart tumor. And you many people use the term sclerus carcinoma of the breast, although it should be restricted to gross. Many people now it's not used at all. Earlier people used to use. So all we know they are all invasive ductal carcinoma with various. Uh, in the extent, the extent of fibrosis, right? It's not okay. You can see it in gross and in radiology. You have sclerosing hepatocellular carcinoma. Fibrosis is also used in the bone marrow. Call it bone marrow fibrosis. Use pulmonary fibrosis and fibromatosis. We don't use bone marrow desmo. Uh, desmoid or sclerous bone marrow or sclerous uh, lung or uh, there we use the term fibrosis. Keloid. Now keloid is, uh, is taken from the word sansroid or uh, it's almost, uh, it was later changed to keloid because it meant a crab-like which was used for uh, cancer. It used to hold the tissues and it had the gross appearance almost like a crab or crab pincers. And that's why he likened it to um, a cancer. He called it canceroid, but then it was changed to keloid. Okay, keloid, of course, is an another example where you have almost hyaluronized collagen forming this uh, <coughs> extra lesion. Then elastosis is whenever the elastic tissue is increased. The elastic tissue typically is seen in blood vessels and in the skin where, you know, you have to have a, a recoil in the blood vessels with every beat, especially in the larger blood vessels, iota and so on. You have. So you get duplication of uh, this uh, elastic tissue in uh, hypertension, what's called benign elastosis. For example, in the skin, uh, they can, you can have degeneration of the elastic tissue, pseudoxanthoma elasticum and so on. So, elastic tissue is generally um, stained, but you can't see them, unlike collagen, which is more pink and you can even do a birefringence. There are special stains for different types of these uh, fibers. For elastic tissue, Van Giesen or uh, Veroff Van Giesen or Orsin stain. Then what is the difference between ectopic and heterotopic? Sometimes people confuse. Ectopic means away from a place or out of the way or out different place. Whenever an organ is ectopic, that means an organ or tissue is ectopic, that means it is located at a place away from its normal conventional location and in that normal location the tissue is not present. For example, if you have an ectopic thyroid in the tongue, base of the tongue actually, or near the larynx, 
that means the thyroid tissue is present here and there's nothing in the neck then you call it ectopic right so your ectopic testis means it is present somewhere inside the abdomen it's not present in the scrotum right so that is what is called ectopic not present in its original position but present elsewhere invariably it is along the line of development heterotopic on the other hand this is heterotopic uh, gastric muco uh, heterotopic gastric mucosa in the duodenum so it means that the tissue there is another tissue there heterotopic tissue and so therefore in the duodenum there is another tissue that is the gastric tissue in heterotopic gastric mucosa here or gastric glands it means this gastric gland present in the duodenum it's also present in the stomach which is its original position heterotopic gastric mucosa in meckel's diverticulum means there is gastric mucosa in the meckel's diverticulum as also in its normal position suppose there was no stomach and it was all in the meckel's diverticulum you would call it ectopic gastric mucosa in meckel's diverticulum right some people sometimes uh, get confused and use this synonymously but this is what the original and the right meaning is ectopic and heterotopic giant cells now giant cells are large cells there is no size cut off but generally 40 microns that is about five times the size of a normal rbc you know uh, or a little larger than that five or six times and it is generally because of similar cells fusing together what's called homotypic cell fusion maybe heterotypic cell fusion also so now you have certain large cells which could be called giant cells uh, which are normally present of physiological or pathological condition the physiological ones are osteoclast syncytiotrophoblast and megakaryocyte osteoclasts of course they are characterized by multiple nuclei and a fairly nice cytoplasm and syncytiotrophoblasts present in the placenta and megakaryocytes well how many nuclei do megakaryocytes have can anyone uh, just answer in the chat box i'll give 5 seconds you just have to write the number Pratika Ah yes, uh, oh, sorry uh, yes, sir. Okay. anyone both of you have they written Yes sir What are they writing 1 nucleus 3 to 5 8 1 okay. more than 3 Actually it's only six. one nucleus hmm. As the megakaryocyte grows in size it replicates its DNA without the cells dividing It's a nuclear the dna increase with that and as a result the nucleus become very large and convoluted and lobulated and in our sections and smears they look as if they are made up of multiple nuclei in fact the megakaryocyte dna complement can be 64 and 32 copies of the normal complement of sir okay now pathological inflammatory we have the foreign body giant cell right you have the foreign body giant cell less nuclear but you will find a foreign body langhans giant cell where they are found in the form of a wreath anishkov cell it's almost like a caterpillar here a shaft cell is different from the anishkov myocyte tuton cell where you have cytoplasm a ring of nucleus and again cytoplasm which generally forming anybody can tell what this cell is anyone has anyone written not yet sir okay 1 2 3 4 5 
ओके राइट दिस इज कॉल्ड क्रूटॉन सेल दिस इज कॉल्ड द क्रूटॉन सेल क्रूटॉन सेल्स दे आर राइटिंग सर अ गुड 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 क्रूटॉन जॉइंट सेल्स वेयर इज इट सीन वॉर्थिन वॉर्थिन समबडी हैज रिटन वॉर्थिन है बटिंग सेल लंग क्रूटॉन जॉइंट सेल lung cryptococcus cryptococcus yes, seen in cryptococcus good yeah. then in viral infections right you can get the herpes giant cells large faded nuclei cytomegalovirus right in cytomegalovirus the, of course you have a nucleus you see this large intranuclear inclusion you can also have cytoplasmic inclusion the cell should be large predominantly seen in endothelial cells and generally if this inclusion occupies more than 3/4 or 75% of the nucleus you can be dead sure it cytomegalovirus warthin fingal t giant cells you get dark nuclei multiple in measles and of course respiratory syncytial virus also you get these giant cells so these are the viral infection where you get in tumors of course osteoclastoma reed sternberg cell anaplastic tumor giant cell rhabdomyoblast generally in tumor giant cells except in say osteoclastoma the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio is high less nuclear but the nucleus occupies almost the entire uh, cell that's what you see others you have neonatal giant cell hepatitis uh, usually they have three or more nuclei not two okay two nuclei in a liver cell can mean regeneration so three or more and you have this muscle giant cells which you see in variety of conditions you have some inclusions in the giant cell which includes asteroid body which looks like star like inclusions which you find in sarcoidosis schumann body but these are not that specific although they are commonly seen in that You may find oxalate crystals, cholesterol crystals, and uh, those of you who are interested in hematopathology will find this Hamazaki Wiesenberg bodies. Okay, right? These are some of the inclusions that you see. Glandular. The word glandular comes from glands or acorn, and you see it looks almost like the glands, normal glands. Really. so the word gland spin is also is from that and you have glands glandes acorn and the reason why the glands secrete and acorns also literally fall off from the tree so it is cast down or it is dropped so that's what i said it was the glands now the word glandular will come to that adenocarcinoma encompasses all types of glandular configuration they could be tubal ductal acinar or follicular depending on the cell of origin okay? and while you see if you see some secretory it could be acinar in origin but very often you don't get anything you just get spaces and there no more than the morphology conventionally whatever is there you call now this tubular is used when there's a long tube uh, like gland it is assumed that these are tubular glands you know they have a very long opening right lobular or acinar is they are made up of lobules connected to a central place and then you have this individual lobules almost like a bunch of grapes right so or berries you know so you have in the pancreas lobules you have in the breast the terminal duct lobular units and so on so on. and by convention anything that arises from the for example in the breast you call it a lobular carcinoma of the breast and so on so forth the word ductal or follicular comes from bellows and what you will find is in the bellows you know the opening this is the place where you press and the air is 
generated and it comes up through a very narrow opening. So when you don't see the opening, you generally call it a duct or a follicle, right? For example, in the thyroid, we know that this colloid, this secretion has, goes out. But because it's presumed there is a duct there, you can't see it. It's like a follicle. It's called a thyroid follicle. Right? There's a hair follicle, very thin opening outside and in the breast also. So you, unlike in the breast where you find a very nice duct going out. Right? So in the lymph node also, they are called follicles because it was believed these follicles secreted the immunoglobulins and other things and therefore that would go out. Right? So you use the term follicle there. Alveolar, when there's a wide opening, a receptacle, and that's used in the lung, alveolar soft part sarcoma, which is the uh, picture here, right? So this is the alveolar soft part sarcoma, right? So then that's when you use alveolus. So the gland that you have are tubular, acinar, alveolar. Then you have merocrine glands. Merocrine glands are those, they have the secretion which goes out. Then apocrine. When the apocrine gland, the secretion beats the surface, it takes a nubbin of, a little bit of cell material around it. So you have this uh, little bit of projections on the surface when they are just going out. And holocrine is when the entire gland dissolves out as in the, the secretions appear and the entire gland breaks as in the sebaceous glands. That's holocrine. So you have merocrine, apocrine and holocrine. So this would be apocrine and the others, one will be merocrine and the sebaceous glands are holocrine. Okay, now then focal. Focal comes from focus, heat or fireplace. That's the central area where the entire family used to sit. So focal means a point of convergence, right? So you have focal or patchy chronic inflammation, inflammatory bowel disease, so focal increase or patchy. You have focal glomerulonephritis in contradistinction to diffuse glomerulonephritis. And there, of course, in the kidney, you use global if the entire glomerulus is affected and segmental when a part of the glomerulus is affected. Granuloma comes from granule or a small grain, right? So hemangiopericytoma or hemangiopericytomatous or hemangiopericytoma-like pattern are characterized by thin walls, thin wall vessels that have a staghorn or antler shaped nucleus and there are various conditions where you get which i have mentioned here okay if there is just a collar of cells surrounding the blood vessels you call it perithelial or perithelomatous appearance and that refers to the cells not to the shape of the blood vessels so this is the staghorn or antler staghorn horn of the antlers and similar shape you can get in which will <coughs> which are called hemangiopericytomatous appearance. This would be perithelial um, arrangement of uh, vessel of cells around the vessel. And this is the hemangiopericytomatous pattern. Okay? It's very important that you see this diagram. Hobnail. Hobnail are those nails which people used to put under the boots so that you get a nice click, especially while saluting or standing in attention. Or they are often used in many other, uh, just generally people walking on streets. So you have a large head and small body. So this is the hobnail appearance. Please note, the nucleus is generally towards the lumen in a hobnail nucleus yeah, appearance. And it's a large one with, in which you almost can make out a head which is wider and a thinner body here. That is hobnail. And it's fairly tall. This is unlike the apocrine which I showed earlier. 
Lacuna. The word lacuna means blank or missing portion. In a, uh, <coughs> or it can mean a hole or a pit. And therefore you have lacuna in the bone. You have lacuna cells which are nothing but retraction artifacts in uh, non in a Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's the lacuna Hodgkin cells. And uh, you find a space in which these cells are there, lacuna. You have a lacunar infarct also. And that was a gross appearance. Now they detect it in CT. Microscopically, there's loss of brain tissue here. And the small area seen in hypertensives mainly. Okay? And this was described by autopsies by Amity de Chambre and uh, five years later by Maxime Durand Fardel, who was a neurologist. Medullary. Medullary comes from soft, or generally it indicates marrow. It's a gross term, but nowadays it's used for intermediate malignancy. So medullary carcinoma of thyroid, breast, and originally it meant a soft tumor. These are, of course, nuclei with empty spaces. In the thyroid, they are called orphan nucleus. In the liver, they are called glycogenated nucleus. So, glycogenated nucleus is seen in the liver, in di diabetics, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, Wilson's disease, and so on and so forth. This is the orphan nucleus typically seen in papillary car carcinoma of the thyroid. So two different places, similar thing. And orphan Annie was a cartoon character. She had a nice little dog, and both of them had rounded eyes, according to the artist, without any pupil in the middle, you know. So that's why you have this orphan Annie. This is a cartoon character in the US. I don't know if the cartoons still exist in the newspapers, right? Papillary. Papillary means there is a fibrovascular core with cells. It means actually a swelling nipple or teeth. And you can have renal papillar taste buds, skin also. And papillomatosis indicates a finger-like configuration, generally over a fibrovascular core. But the cores may be absent in introductory papillomatosis. And there actually micropapillary or epitheliosis is a better term to be used. So you see, this, this is different where you have a stroma also <coughs> in a villi. This is just a fibropapillary core in a transitional cell, papillary transitional cell lesion. This is in the skin and these are in the breast. There's no fibrovascular core. So many say there's better to use micropapillary and epitheliosis for such lesion. Pearls. Pearls are pearls, all of you know. These pearls are seen in squamous cell carcinoma, and indeed they look like pearls. Perineural invasion is actually perineural lymphatic invasion. There is no lymphatic actually. It's actually a perineural space around which the tumor spreads. Typical of prostate and adenoid cystic carcinoma, right? Fill loads. Fill loads means leaf-like. And you see these are typically leaf-like uh, configurations seen in the lesion called phyllodes tumor, what was earlier called cystosarcoma phyllodes. Phyllides, some people. Physaliferous means bubble-like, typically seen in chordoma. So they are large, bubble-like appearance of cells. Okay? And Samoma bodies means grains of sand, sand-like. And then, of course, you find these uh, calcific bodies, which are seen in various conditions. And they generally have a concentric layer around them. Typical is seen in meningiomas, in certain tumors of the ovary, right? Samomatis. Reticula means net-like, fish net-like. So you see it in various conditions and plexiform is also net-like but it's not used synonymously. 
Roman bridge. Roman bridges are, this is the typical Roman bridge in which you have rigid pillars here and a rounded uh, opening for the water to flow through and there's a bridge where it's thin here. And these Roman bridge appearances are typically seen in Casino, in, <coughs> in uh, introductory carcinomas of the breast. Rosettes. Rosettes are rose like they are commemorative. You can see it in the uh, church. And then you f there are different kinds of rosettes. Some have, two have central lumen. They are called uh, Bailey's true rosettes. Flexners or uh, Flexner Winstina rosettes with an empty lumen, an epidermal uh, rosette which contains cilia. So there are two with the central lumen. And there are two which don't have distinct lumen. Homerite or neuroblastoma rosette have a tangle of uh, neurites in the middle. And perivascular or glial vascular rosettes seen in astrocytic and epidermal tumors. Now, these two are also called pseudorosettes, right? The, those which do not have a distinct lumen are also called pseudorosettes. Uh, but the term pseudorosette is best avoided. And you call them by their proper name. True rosette, pseudorosette. Pseudo rosette may have a vessel. So, ependymal rosette, flex the Winterstina rosettes and Homerite rosettes, right? So these are the different types of rosettes that you see when you do neuropathology, you learn more about these. There are other things. You can get rosettes in uh, neuroendocrine tumors where you have a central lumen with the nucleus pointing away from this lumen you can get in various neuroendocrine tumors. In the liver, you can get a cholestatic rosette with cholestasis or a canaliculus in the middle or a hepatitic rosette where there's no space full of hepatocytes seen in autoimmune other inflammatory conditions. So these are the rosettes. Schiller duval bodies described by Walter Schiller and Mathias Mary Duval. So they are generally like a glomerulus almost. You have a blood vessel in the middle with cells all around, right? Right. So this is typically seen in the endodermal sinus of rat during the normal development. And this has been likened and seen in many of the yolk sac tumors of human beings, right? They mimic the endodermal sinus of the developing rat, okay? And this is different from a glomerulite body. So in a glomerulus, you not, not only have epithelial cells and this, you also have mesangial cells there. Okay? So these are the parts. You have an allantoic vessel in the middle, the yolk sac endoderm, and a labyrinth, which is the space all around. Signet ring cells, they, are, they have an eccentric hyperchromatic nucleus. The round clear cells which represents a ring. They may have uh, <clears throat> certain intracellular mucins. On the other hand, the colloid carcinomas have abundant extracellular mucin. Signet ring carcinomas have got intracellular mucin. And colloid carcinomas have extracellular mucin. Mucifages are macrophages that have taken up. Now, the word signet ring, many say they are wedding ring. They are not wedding rings. It is a ring of the king, uh, which had the insignia of the kingdom. And on the wax, he used to just put his seal of the kingdom. Or that was his signature or signa. That's why it's called the signet ring. And that is why these rings are called signet rings. They have nothing to do with the wedding. Eh? Many people say it's wedding ring. And this is how it is. Okay? So, spindle. Spindle is of course used for uh, in 
weaving clothes and getting these uh, threads on so it has pointed ends one end may be more pointed than the other so these are spindle cell nuclei spindle cell nucleus some in the the nucleus in neural tumors are not only spindly but they are wavy okay so fascicle fascicle is nothing but like you have you see you have with an a5 fascicle they are a bunch of books together fascicle means a bunch together and you see these uh, tumor cells the sarcoma with uh, this mesenchymal cells which are spindly arranged in a fascicle or a bunch like this almost streaming across so that's the time when you use fascicular arrangement of cells right story form story form is derived from story or matting the end of a mat you see they are round they almost include whirly gig spoke wheel pin wheel spiral nebula all kinds of world appearance okay it's not diagnostic of any condition although they are most commonly seen in dermatofibromas efsps so this is the story form pattern that you see in the end of the week the best way to remember these are the different patterns you can get almost like the fingerprint and so on so forth best way to remember is this is the cowlick of the back of the hair best seen in boys you can get these are three story form patterns three cowlicks they are called cowlicks because the tongue of a cow when it moves like this it gives this pattern so this is a typical story form pattern for you right so in case the boy next to you can see the back and you find so these are the different story form patterns okay so that you see in different human herring bone this is a herring fish and they have typically very nice fine bones which are parallel from the spine you know and the herring bone pattern was described in many tumors most uh, commonly in what was called fibrosarcomas you know squamous surface of the scale of a fish and really the squam squamous surface looks like that okay flash lepidic lepidic means it's on the surface of the alveolus or a space like this and it also means scale or a flat superficial growth so this is seen typically in bronchial alveolar carcinoma a lepidic growth okay trabeculae trabeculae means thick beams they may be arranged in very broad groups when it is called insular if they are arranged in serpentine or angulated it is called festoon and if it is freely anastomosing it's called plexiform so it's a trabecular arrangement which could be insular festoon plexiform okay and uh, there are different conditions insular is seen in carcinoids festoons are seen in neuroendocrine tumors endodermal sinus tumors plexiform in some salivary glands blood vessels and liposarcomas the blood vessels of liposarcoma this would be you see the trabecular pattern insular pattern right almost like islands you know insular pattern festoon pattern with the wavy things okay and this is the reticular pattern so these are the different patterns that you see under trabecular pattern right plexiform of course is almost like the <coughs> hair braided together and then you have this plexiform pattern in fact this even in neurofibroma gross pattern is the plexiform neurofibromatosis indian five now you see many people walk like this you can make out there are many people walking you know there are different and here also you know there's many people walking but uh, red indians you know they used to walk especially during war in a 
single file. Person one would walk and the person two behind him would put his footsteps exactly on top of this and the third one would put on top of this. So, to an enemy it would look as if only one person has walked past. Actually, there would have been hundreds or even thousands walking past. That is the Indian file appearance. Single file appearance is called Indian file appearance, right? And that is typically seen in lobula carcinoma of the breast. Single file of tissue. Palisade. Palisade means a wooden fence generally enclosing an area. So this is a palisading appearance. They are parallel to each other. Villas means a tuft of hair and you have this villi, especially in the intestine. Zelbalan means a group of cells, you know, cluster of cells, almost like a small packet. And you can get this appearance in, say, pheochromocytomas and other. Immunohistochemistry, you have certain staining patterns, nuclear, cytoplasmic, membranous. And they are self-explanatory, you know. Oh, this is a cytoplasmic, this is a nuclear pattern, this is a membranous pattern. And in addition, there may be variations. So generally, nuclear pattern is seen in transcription factors, steroid hormones, proliferation markers, hepatitis, core antigen, and S100. It's typically nuclear. Cytoplasmic, you can see in variety of uh, epithelial markers that you see. Nuclear and cytoplasmic combined, you can get in certain other two things like S100, calretinine, beta catenine. It could be diffuse, it could be membranous, it could be granular, punctate or dot like, like CD99, certain neuroendocrine, uh, <coughs> and uh, certain cytokeratins in certain tumors, targetoid of wall and chain appearance. So you use these terms depending on how the staining pattern is. They are typical in certain conditions, right? So diffuse, you get in intermediate filaments, contractile proteins, secretory protein, melanosome-associated proteins. And membranous is most CD3, 20, surface receptors like EGFR, HER2 new, addition molecules like e -cathering. Granular, you get in my, uh, mitochondrial or Golgi or lysosomal immunostochy when you do. Punctate or dot-like, when you do a pan-CK, small cell carcinoma, CK in Merkel cell tumors, CD13 in ALCL, and CD15 in classical Hodgkin's. Targetoid, that is a ball and a chain, where you see a little... Yeah, double staining pattern almost, which is targetoid, ball and chain pattern. Seen in CD30 or ALCL and CD15 in certain instances. But as you go along and, for example, you will have various slight sessions with people like uh, Dr. Borges, she'll tell you exactly which one to accept as good staining and what is the staining to expect in each of these conditions when you go further. So, in pathology reporting, one of the problem is the clinician tells it's ambiguous. You use terms which are ambiguous. So, ambiguous means the meaning is unclear, it can be interpreted in more than one ways. So, when the dog ran out the house, it fell. Whether the house fell or the dog fell, it's not clear in this. So that's ambiguous. So when you, most pathology reports nowadays will have a bit of clinical detail, site of uh, procedure, diagnosis may precede the gross and microscopic description or it may be given at the end. And then you can give a comment, right? Uh, usually many prefer to give the diagnosis in the end. So it has to be clear, concise and consistent and all the elements necessary for a clinical decision made. No point in writing a flowery language which the clinician does not understand and he cannot take a decision out of the end of the report.
right and in fact uh, you must have uh, certain comments and uh, should be in a format which you can retrieve easily uh, when you search put a search uh, in your database for certain diagnosis you get it out and the quality of information in a report actually defines our competence how competent we are uh, two kinds of report narrative and synoptic in synoptic it's most of the things are given you know it's almost like a checklist that you keep ticking and you get the report even the radiologists use this form of uh, reporting very often right so for example this chronic hepatitis you can write chronic hepatitis hcv etiology with a grade and a stage and say which system you are using or you can write cirrhosis with moderate necroinflammatory activity it is better than just writing chronic hepatitis you know so it gives the clinician a little more it means almost the same thing but you are giving that it indicates this cirrhosis you also indicate this moderate activity and of course you have given the etiology and you have given the rest like this symbol so the report should tell give some information to the clinician which you can understand we often use various terms and of which you know diagnostic of characteristic of apparently they are more definitive than others and many use the term in keeping with an indicative of almost synonymously but apparently indicative of is more confirmatory than in keeping with because we all know consistent with is more than compatible right and compatible with means if you have seen lichen planus grossly you also see something which may be lichen planus red compatible right similarly you must remember probable is much higher than possible if something is probable it is more likely than if something is possible it's possibly a cancer and it's probably a cancer probable would be more definite and people use a variety of terms there are 37 terms that could be uh, that was uh, seen in a survey of two english speaking region and it meant a variety of things to different people but anyway you have to speak a language which your clinician understand that's more the important so these some of the uh, definitive terms in a report that people use are here a non definitive you are not sure and uncertainty are these you know features are indicative or are in keeping or comfortable right features are very strongly favor glioblastoma because of this a diagnosis of glioblastoma is not in turn entirely certain because certain diseases can mimic similarly and so on so forth you have to be clear in your uh, report and uh, it's very important uh, you will learn what is uh, how to report each and everything as you go through the entire set of lectures from different people and many times you will know that more than the exact reporting sometimes it doesn't make too much of a difference in the clinical management that also you will know all right so these are different things that people should were using so many times you have to take a second opinion ask for help if you are not understanding something there's nothing to be ashamed of now i'll just come to certain colors salmon pink is the color of salmon fish it is typically orange not pink although it's called pink okay and the salmon pink color is what you see in uh, congo red staining in amyloidosis apple green is the color of apple green it's bright green with slight yellow tint almost like a green apple and here i must tell you whenever you do um, polarize uh,
congruent stain MLI, there are two things. You have a birefringent which gives the shine and dichroism which gives the apple green color. Okay, so there's double ring. Yeah. So because different lights are absorbed. Miliary tuberculosis, that's actually a gross term where the size of those lesions are less than 2 millimeters. It's like the millet seeds, they are small grains. And this is seen even radiologically. So not a microscopic term, it is a gross term, right? So this is related to millet seeds. Stools, you could get butter stools when it is steatoria, fatty stools when there's excess amount of fat, it's almost like butter stool. Current jelly stools in intersusception is because of blood and inflammatory product. And rice water stools is whitish with certain flocules, typically seen in cholera, you know. And uh, it's, a, it's seen in serous diarrhea. So this much is for food and stools. You can have spinach stools. Right? When there is intestinal hurry, pea soup stools, when it is grayish or greenish or yellow with certain uh, solid material, is almost greenish. That's the pea soup stools. Sago green stools you get in amoebic. Sago is what is called sabudana for you. Right? So you have stools of different colors for your. For your liking. Fish, of course, anchovy sauce, amoebic, and that's the amoebic abscess, that's the color green. Anchovy fish is very expensive, you know, just like salmon. Fish flesh appearance is typically seen in sarcomas, gross, right? A mitral stenosis could be like a fish mouth or a buttonhole. Buttonhole is almost linear like that. Cut cabbage appearance you get in fibroadenomas and also in benign hyperplasic prostate. Cauliflower growth is like a real cauliflower in carcinoma. Other vegetables are onion peel. You get in primary sclerosing cholangitis, in the x-ray appearance of wing sarcoma, sago spleen, get in amyloidosis. Bread and butter pericarditis are two slices of bread with butter inside and pulled apart. So you get this little bit of raised areas or small spicules of butter sticking out. And that's the bread and butter pericarditis because of so fibrinous pericarditis in rheumatic heart disease. Other fruits are strawberry gallbladder, cholesterolosis, prune belly. So you get this almost a crumpled appearance of the skin and lying in babies, prune belly syndrome, very aneurysm, yeah. beauty orange, that is the surface of the orange, so much yeah, that you get in lymphatic obstruction, breast carcinoma, the surface of the skin. Botria tumor looking like grapes, hereditary form mole, there's a drop, almost looks like multiple drops, right? Then you have the salt and pepper nuclei, you have this almost light and dark colored granular nuclei. Nutmeg liver, jaifal that you put in biryani and other things, the cut surface looks almost like this chronic venous congestion of the liver, right? Coffee bean appearance, granulocytosal tumor and certain other tumor, typical nuclear groove, right? LCH also you can get this groove. Coffee ground vomitus, that is because of acid emitting forming in the stomach in <clears throat> yeah, when you vomit blood. Okay. And then leg of mutton appearance. It's really like a leg of mutton, you know, osteosarcoma. Chicken fat you get in thrombi, in postmortem thrombi. Then leg of mutton appearance in you know, earlier there were uh, these dresses which had a leg of mutton appearances, okay? And uh, it's very interesting that the same appearance is seen in osteosarcoma. So I end with that. So we 
can have wisdom first by reflection second by imitation and which is the easiest and third by experience which is bitterest please see as many slides as you can interact with your peers and your teachers and everyone and learn there's everything there's many things you can learn every moment you learn something new and there are many things we even we with so many years of so called experience we do not know we are learning daily and uh, with this i think i'll end and uh, don't miss to see every opportunity of gross specimens or slides or form procedures and enjoy yourself you have taken up one of the best specialties in medicine uh, which you'll not uh, regret you may not get a lot of money like me but 